At Mozilla, we are interested in open voice, right? We're interested in how we can make sure that there is a way that the innovation that the internet brings to the people can continue in new domains. Um, it is becoming apparent, I don't think anybody would be here in this room if they didn't believe that voice work um, was crucial and that voice was not going to be the key interface for commuting, computing in the future, right? Um, you've probably got the same slide lying around that I've got somewhere that claims that 50% um, of all voice searches will, of all searches will be voiced by 2020. Um, I also don't believe that per se, but I think it's a sort of interesting baseline to make sure that we understand um, I don't believe the 50% like as a raw number. As a trend, absolutely, right? Voice is a dead cheap and dead good way of interacting with stuff. Uh, what you want to see is some ways that we've tried to explore that. Um, there's two things that I think are key observations that sometimes get elided in these discussions. The first is that we're in these data-driven economies. It used to be we were in algorithm-driven economies, right? So we would try and come up with a new thing. It was quite simple. All I had to do was hire some scientist on my team, and she just had to be smarter than the scientist on your team, right? Um, great. That, that's actually a sort of weirdly democratic way of doing things. And now we have this sort of Matthew's Law thing in that if we're doing innovation by scraping data, then people who already have that data can create innovation. And people who don't have that data, it's really hard to compete. If you're going to, imagine you're going to start up and you, you think, oh, I've got a really good idea for doing a self-driving car. It's really hard to compete against existing self-driving cars. So that's this problem with data-driven economies, right? And there are degrees to which that's a valuable and useful thing. But one of the things that we believe at Mozilla is we really want to open up opportunities for there to be more innovation. Um, it's not clear to me that the right way to get the best interfaces is to have, say, two large companies or three large companies do all the innovation. I really believe that the right way is to have a whole bunch of people do it. Um, and the second thing is this question about key loggers, right? Imagine if we think that voice is going to replace the keyboard. Um, imagine if every keyboard that was made right now had a key logger in it and sent it to some large company. That's the situation we're in with voice, and we think there's opportunities to do better. So. Let's think about the situation we're in. Um, those of you who, like me, have been in this world for a while will remember in 2008, Mary Mika put out a graph um, in which she said, look, the future is mobile. And everyone sort of waved their hands and, and panicked. Um, this is putting some numbers on the sort of a, a, this rhetorical graph. This is what the world looks like right now. We're at something like, ah, call it four and a half, four billion cell phone, uh, smartphones out there. Um, PCs seem to be leveling off at about the 350 million, some sort of range like that. We're seeing smart speakers on a track to go, to be a more uh, common device than PCs. VR headsets are down there. They're getting, they're going through a down bit. I want to believe they'll go back up again, but that's what that looks like. But people are concerned. So when we go and ask people their concerns about this, and I think this is a key thing that I would love to see more work on. Um, People are concerned about having these devices in their home. In general, we're seeing, I mean, as you see by that, that adoption curve on smart speakers, people are generally wanting to have these in their home because it is the best way to do various things. And I'll talk about what those things are people do in a second. It is the best way to set a timer for your pasta that anyone has ever invented. The best way is to say, hey, Alexa, set a timer for my pasta for 10 minutes, right? Great, right? So we see those trade-offs, but I think we're seeing people increasingly concerned about this. And if you look at the tech lash, if you look at the fact that I can look at graduate students in computer science on Stanford's campus, and I look at their Twitter bios, and it says, fuck Silicon Valley in it, right? You've got to be concerned about that. We can't just accept that as normal. We need to take this seriously as something that will impact the future of technology as an industry. So what are people doing? Are they just setting timers, right? Um, this is some work that was led by a guy called Tofik Amari, who is currently um, uh, on the job market. He's a PhD student at the University of Michigan and a super, super smart dude. Um, it's not the world's prettiest graph, but what we did was to go onto Reddit and we said, hey, will anybody let us uh, look at your data on how you actually use Alexa? And we got about 100 people. Um, and some of my colleagues, Frank Bentley, who some of you might know over at Yahoo!, did the same thing with Google Home data. So what you're seeing here is a total of about a quarter of a million voice commands. Um, people are mainly doing music, right? People are mainly, like it really is, hey Alexa, play Desperado, like it is that. Um, we're seeing search show up there in, in that 
uh, mix. And we're seeing, as expected, Google Home does a bit better than search than Alexa does. Um, notice that IoT is down there. Uh, Alexa stuff is about 16%. Google Home is about 10%. Um, we're seeing a lot of mistakes. I believe that number has gone down. This data is a little bit old. But we're sort of three quarters of the way around the pie, and we've said three things, right? We've, we've talked about search, we've talked about music, we've talked about IoT. Um, volume stuff is really interesting. So you can go and look at this paper. It's in the ACM Digital Library. It's the second most downloaded paper um, in Tokai right now. Um, I was kind of, no one's ever, I've never had a paper that's been the second most downloaded one in Tokai before. I'm quite proud of that. Um, there's some interesting things like in Alexa, for example, the number of volume down commands is about 5% more than the number of volume up commands, right? Suggesting that Alexa is set at a little bit too high a volume. Um, I love having data like that to deal with. So given this, what are other ways? This is a log analysis, right? This gives sort of one way of generating understandings and one way of generating knowledge in the world. What are other ones? We do a lot of surveys, and we do surveys in a whole bunch of different ways. And I picked this slide because it tells you sort of, this was one particular survey asking how people wanted to listen to things on the web. Um, notice that we're trying three different conditions. Uh, so those are sort of three questions that we ask. Um, we're doing things on Reddit. We're doing things on SurveyMonkey. And what this looks like is if someone opens up their browser, see this thing up here? Uh, this is the cue for the people in the back of the room to tell me to go back to the microphone. Um, but if you see those, that little drop down there, we can, ask, we can do survey work in Firefox at enormous scale. And it's great to sort of see the sort of answers that we get out of that. We can do it in multiple languages as well. So we tried doing this snippet in, in the US, in Germany, and in France. And we found things like, you know, where did people want to listen to things? Um, where, did they want to have the, where did they want to listen to stuff? And why were they listening? Why were they listening to information? Um, and the key thing about listening is you can do it while your hands are doing other things. And I know that's like a completely obvious point. Of course that's why people listen to things, right? Of course that's why they listen to music on their speakers. Of course that's why they listen to the radio when they're doing the washing up. But this idea that this is a core thing about listening. Um, do any of you use Pocket? Anybody? Right? Some of you use Pocket. It's a great way you come across an article on the web, you say, this is interesting, I'd like to read it later. You click a button and it goes into your pocket and you can read it later. You can also listen to it later. So my team put together a uh, system, we're currently using the Alexa voices for that. Um, and so you can sit there and it can play all the articles that you came across yesterday that you're like, ah, oh, I should get around to doing. And we found that people want to do it in this multitasking kind of way. Um, I'm gonna talk about two more things and then, then a wrap up, finish up thing. This question of why do people listen, I think is actually uh, sort of fundamental. Um, so we did a bunch of field work last summer. Um, I, we took a couple of interns to Europe. Um, both I and my lead researcher, Janice Sai, took our whole families with us. Um, and we basically spent a month going around Europe um, t telling our children to stop complaining. Um, we did a whole bunch of field work. In every city we were in, we did four different interviews in, in people's homes. We did workshops in each one of these places where we invited usually four or five people to come and sit in a room and tell us about their listening. Um, it was super fun, but we learned these three core things, and I think these are sort of fundamental to the human existence, which is why I bothered to put this extra slide in here. One is that people listen to the things that, that identify with, right? I listen to British comedy podcasts, right? And people say, would you like to listen to this work-related podcast? And I say rude words back at them, because I don't want to listen to a work-related podcast. I spend enough time at work. When I'm listening to podcasts, it reinforces my identity as a British person with a sense of humor, right? That's what I'm listening to. The second is we work around known constraints, and we saw this everywhere, and we sort of forget this, particularly in Silicon Valley, where we have access to large, expensive telephones, um, where we have basically ubiquitous internet. But every time we saw people, they would say, well, I'm running out of space on my phone, so I download the podcast, and then I delete the ones I've been doing before. I know that when I get on the tube in London, I can't actually get to uh, anything, but um, it turns out that the, tube, the, the, so the underground in Hamburg has much better internet, so it's fine there. Um, I'm concerned about battery life, and so I'll, I'll have a separate device that I only use for podcasts, because um, that way when I come home at the end of the day, my phone is tired. So people work around constraints. And the third thing they do is they support their existing routines. 
People don't just listen at some random time. They listen when it's the right time to listen. They'll listen, uh, the people in Hamburg, is anyone from Hamburg, any Germans here? In Hamburg, the way that you know you are, you are a Hamburg hamburger, I think it is. It doesn't sound right. The way you know you're a hamburger is you listen to the six o'clock news. This is what everyone does, right? And they were like, well, it's very important about being German, right? And I was like, this is fascinating. This is, again, sort of reinforces that identity and they have this routine. These are not always routines that are fixed in time. It's not that I commute between 8 and 8.30. Um, breastfeeding was one that came up. Like, um, mothers would say, yeah, I know that the breastfeeding is going to happen. It's, I'm going to sit there maybe, maybe 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, but my hands are going to be busy. I need to have something to listen to during that routine. All right, I want to talk about one more research project, um, which is evaluating text-to-speech quality, because I think this is one of the core things that are part of voice user interfaces. Um, you were saying that you'd been using uh, the Mycroft voices, um, and I, we'll, we'll talk about why that might not be the best project moving forward. Um, but the big thing is, I, if you look at conferences like Interspeech, um, like in general, you look at the speech world on this, they don't do a lot of long-term listening. They do a lot of short sentences. There's a lot of work. Um, Larry, you probably know this stuff a lot better than I do. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of short-term things that are like, listen to one sentence, listen to one paragraph. So we picked one particular article. It's called How to Reduce Your Stress in Five Minutes a Day. I think my whole team can just repeat it like with our eyes closed now. Um, and we would take all these different robot voices and have them read the article, and then we get 50 people on Mechanical Turk to listen to it and rate it on various things. So we would say, um, is, this, uh, you know, is this a voice you'd like to listen to? Do you want to hear this again? Um, how, how highly would you rate it? Um, we tested, approximately speaking, all the voices. I mean, it's obviously not true. We, we tested a wide variety of voices across different providers, including some humans. Um, myself, um, people on my team, our intern, Julia, um, and we also have a control of reading the text. And there's a whole bunch of data here, and <laughs> I feel like this is, this is sort of very typical in the talk. You put up a very dense slide that's got writing too small to read on and then run away. Um, but I will point out some things. So the orange circles here, these are humans. Um, this is me. I am currently winning our uh, team contest on this. Yes. Um, but I think it's mainly because we're testing on Americans. Americans like British accents. Um, notice that my colleague Janice is down there. And Janice has a... I mean, if, if she was here, you wouldn't be like, oh, my God, she sounds weird and horrible to listen to. She doesn't at all. She sounds, has a perfectly reasonable speaking voice. But all of those ones in the middle are voices that are uncomparable or better to human quality, right? Um, that's the stage we're at with text-to-speech. We're getting voices, at least in English, that are as good as humans, and I think that's fascinating. The blue one there is uh, just reading it yourself, right? If you just read it and you have, that, we've got that as a sort of baseline, um, and we had to modify the question a little bit, but uh, that sort of idea of how you generate data is really crucial. Um, we, up there, uh, the new poly voices from Amazon, Good job there. The neural, the newscaster voice is doing pretty well. Um, there's a bunch of the Mozilla voices that I'm actually pleased to see. Our new systems are doing pretty well there. Um, notice the ones down the far end, um, Mycroft. The default iOS voice is uh, not good. That's the second worst one over there. Um, and the default Android vo voice, so there's no, <laughs> mobile phones have lousy voices right now, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Okay. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give myself one more minute. Um, there are three areas where I think we need to see this growth, and I think the people in this room are likely the right people to see that happen. One is getting better at doing consumer voice products, right? How can we build things that have privacy and security built in? Because I think this is the direction that we're seeing society go, and it's the direction that I think we want to see society go. Um, those of you who were at the AI conference uh, on Monday and Tuesday, there's this world in which there are a set of values about the way that we think the world should be, and those can be encapsulated in the way that we design these interfaces. It's important to design with privacy, with security first. Um, the same is true with developer tools, moving towards the sort of offline stuff, federated learning, ways in which we can get away from the fact that voice interfaces are a key logger. Um, I don't think any of us in this, in this room are happy about that. Um, it's a sort of inevitable consequence of some of the decisions we've made, but there's opportunity there. 
And the third is thinking about what open voice stack coalitions look like around technology, around opportunities to move forward, around legal threats, because I assure you there will be legal threats and they will be coming pretty soon, um, as uh, both, on, both in the US and in the, U in, and in the EU. Um, and I think we need to be able to have a coherent way to respond to that. Um, and if right now there is not that coherent way to respond to it, and I think we need to have that, um, particularly with political changes that we're seeing on the horizon. Okay, I want to do one more thing, which is to enlist all of your help. Um, in my copious free time, uh, I run the Mozilla Research Grant Program. Um, and this is not quite the same scale as the, the effort that you have at Sloan, um, kind of off by a few orders of magnitude, I think. But we try and get every, twice a year, we put out some questions that we think are really crucial. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting is how often you're seeing, of our seven questions here, um, five of them, I think, are directly relevant to the work that's going on in this room. So uh, if you see something here that's interesting, please look me up on Twitter because they're all on there. Um, and if there's people that you know, academics, researchers, people at nonprofit institutes who are doing interesting work that answer these sort of questions about, uh, about surveillance, about different cultures, uh, cultural attitudes to privacy and security. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this last one, which is thinking if we get to this open voice ecosystem, if we if succeed with what we're trying to do here, what are the kind of cultural and social and political impacts we can imagine? What, what are the things that we're not thinking about right now that might have impact around having this kind of technology out there in the world? And I think having those sort of questions forefront of my, in our minds are really important. All right, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you all very much.